Let's start with some weird questions. It's always a good place to start. Do you ever talk to yourself? Do you ever have conversations with yourself? Like long, in-depth conversations? Right? Doc likes to throw memes around from time to time. Here's one from me. It says, of course I talk to myself. Sometimes I need expert advice. That's fun. Do you know that there's actually books about this? Books written about how to talk to yourself? There's a book called What to Say When You Talk to Yourself to give you some advice. If you go on YouTube, you'll find all sorts of different uh, little uh, uh, videos of people talking through, telling you how you can appropriately talk to yourself. And it's kind of strange to me, but it kind of also makes some sense, right? There's some good helpful ideas there. More weird questions. When you talk to yourself, where do those words come from? Right? When you talk to yourself, where do those words come from and who's listening? When you talk to yourself, who's speaking and who's listening? Who's creating the words? Who's hearing them? These are weird questions, right? It's kind of like for me, it's these mental gymnastics trying to figure this out. On the flip side of the talking is the listening part. Do you ever listen to yourself? Do you ever listen to yourself? If you were to do a quick internet search and kind of look through the idea of listening to yourself, you're going to find some websites that say it's awful to listen to yourself. In fact, they'll say you should never listen to yourself. And it's weird, right? But it kind of makes sense to me. I can understand that some. There's also plenty of websites that suggest that you should only listen to yourself. The complete opposite. You should never listen to yourself. You should only listen to yourself. When you talk to yourself, who's listening? When you listen to yourself, who's talking? Where do those words come from? Who's speaking? Who's listening? And is it ever not you? Kind of a weird question, right? Is it ever not you? Is it ever you, or is it ever not you that's speaking? Entertainment has kind of played around with this motif some. You've probably seen the cartoons with the angel and the devil on their shoulders, right? I think of Tom and Jerry or The Simpsons or one of the all-time classic movies, The Emperor Guy's New Groove, right? Is there any semblance of truth to this? Is there ever a voice speaking to me in that kind of a way? Does God ever talk to us like that? There's a story in the Old Testament about a guy named Elijah He's a prophet of God. God talked to him frequently, had conversations with him. Uh, Elijah was a prophet, and so his job was to proclaim messages to the people that God would give him, all normal stuff for a prophet. There's this time when Elijah asks to see God. Elijah asks that God would reveal himself and show himself to him, and so Elijah finds himself in this cave up on this mountain overlooking this valley, and God tells him that he's going to pass by. And there's this, like, powerful wind that sweeps through this valley in front of Elijah. And then there's this ground-shaking earthquake. And then there's even this fire that just kind of blows through, again, this valley in front of him. These big, powerful expressions. And the expectation is that God is in these powerful expressions. But God wasn't in any of them. Then it says that God showed up, and it was like a gentle whisper. The Lord speaking usually doesn't come with fireworks or explosions or thunder or lightning or any other dramatic or spectacular event. It's this gentle voice. And I wonder, I wonder whether or not Elijah actually heard God with his ears or if it was something much more internal. I wonder. We've been doing this sermon series called Listen, and we've been looking at what it looks like to do life with God and what it's like to be able to hear God. We've been using a book called Jesus Speaks, and it's written by a guy named Leonard Sweet, and he says that there's five lighthouses, meaning there's five ways in which God will speak to us. If you want to hear the voice of God, these are the five ways that he chooses to do so. We've talked about three of them. The first one, the most significant one, the most foundational one, is the testimony of Scripture. We talked about that first. This idea that, that, that the foundation for understanding of what God speaks to us is his word, it's Scripture. 
It's the most trustworthy, the most sure way we have of knowing what it is that God will speak into our lives. And it's the measuring stick for every other one of these other lighthouses. Every other single one that we consider comes back to Scripture. The second one that we talked about was the body of Christ, that God uses us, one another, followers of Jesus, to speak his truth into the lives of the people around us. When we live in close proximity with one another, we're able to hear the voice of God. Last week, Doc talked about what Sweet calls wisdom. Now, that's not exactly the word that Doc used, but it's still the same kind of a big idea, that God has revealed his will. We have freedom in our ability to make decisions within that will, and there's even these ways in which God may nudge us toward a specific decision, either pulling or pushing us towards a certain decision. He used this graphic of the circle and the dots and the magnet to help us understand this will of God. Really what we're talking about is this big idea of wisdom. This morning we're going to talk about these two other lighthouses, and they fit really well with what Doc talked about last week, these nudges. What does it look like? For this magnet, when it pushes and pulls us, what does it look like? Two of the most prominent ways in which God nudges us are these two other lighthouses that Sweet refers to in his book. He calls them the conscience and instincts. It's our conscience and our instincts. And they're linked together really well this morning because they both come from this inner dialogue, these ways that we talk to ourselves. But they're different. They're unique from one another. They function in different kinds of of ways. We'll start with the conscience. When we talk about the conscience, I'll often think of the word conviction. Each of us has a conscience, and each of us is convicted. We each have these convictions that exist within us, each of us. And it's a gift from God. God has designed us and made us with this inward monitor that goes off when we do something right or when we do something wrong. And it's called a conscience. We also have the ability to shift it, to adjust it. We can rebuild it off of our own understanding of what is right and what is wrong. It's a hardwired thing that we all have that exists within us, and we, we all have this, but we also all do this. We all shift it. We constantly rewrite our own conscience to our own convenience. Things like this. There's an interesting phrase that exists that you've used, I've used, we've all used, a simple phrase, white lie. Do you know what a white lie is? It's a lie that I'm comfortable with, (laughs) right? You've done this before. We know that lying is wrong. Our conscience convicts us of that truth, but I call it a white lie if it's a small enough lie. It's not that big of a deal. I can downplay it. I can bring it down to a different level. We all shape our consciences, don't we? Sometimes we shape it for good, and sometimes we really mess it up. And all of this that I'm saying is true whether you are a Jesus follower or not. If you aren't a Jesus follower, you have a conscience that will hold you accountable to the standards that you've chosen in life. Now, there's exceptions like, you know, if you're a psychopath, all right, and you've just removed any conscience from you, but that's probably not you. (laughs) Probably. So even if you aren't a Jesus follower, you have a conscience. If you are a Jesus follower, you should have an elevated conscience because there's a spiritual component to this. A Jesus follower has a standard. They have a conscience just like a non-Jesus follower. The only difference is that a Jesus follower has adopted a different standard and I believe a higher standard. This is what it looks like. I think most people would agree, just about every person I know would admit and agree and acknowledge that according to their conscience, the act of adultery is wrong. I think we kind of just accept that across the board. But there's higher standards than just adultery, aren't there? There are some people who would suggest that pornography is equal or or is evil. That's unacceptable. There's some who don't. There's some people who don't feel like there's anything wrong with it. There's some people who live by a different standard, but there seems as if there's a a higher standard than adultery in the viewing of, of what we put before our eyes. There's a difference in conscience, right? And yet for the Jesus follower, this guy Jesus, he taught an even higher standard. He said you shouldn't even look at a woman in lust. 
Every person has a conscience. Every Jesus follower has a conscience with a higher standard. It's an inward monitor that goes off when we step out of God's will or when we're walking in his will. It's a way in which God may be speaking to you, and there's something, something really interesting to me. According to Scripture, even if you aren't a Jesus follower, your conscience is a way in which God may be speaking to you, which is a weird thought, that you don't have to be a follower of Jesus for God to want to speak to you and that he may be, in fact, speaking to you through your conscience. We see this in Romans chapter 2. Paul writes this very thing. He explains it. It's kind of confusing when you read it, but he explains it. He says that people without the law of God will sometimes still fulfill the law of God. And it's because there's these places where these standards, these standards of conscience that we've built sometimes will overlap. Even though we've started in different starting points and built in different places, they will sometimes overlap. And according to Paul, that could be God working in you to lead and to guide you. Because God speaks to us through our conscience. And we're all capable of distorting it. The problem with our conscience is that sometimes we can violate it so frequently that it ceases to operate. And some things we violate our conscience so much that it ceases to operate. We break our own conscience, our own standard, so much that we become callous to our convictions. In fact, the Bible uses the word seared. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, he says, Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. It's not just about these hypocritical liars who are teachers. It's what we all do. Can you look back in your life and see the things that used to bother you that don't anymore? I heard a story of a friend from mine this week about a time in his life that was heavily shaped by his environment. He was active in the military. He was in a highly intense, hostile place overseas. He was in the constant like, crucible of pressure, and it caused him to miss some of the ways in which he had begun to change. And he didn't realize just how much he had changed until much later. While he was still on duty overseas, he wanted to encourage his family back home. He wanted to let them know that he was doing okay. And so he decided to make a slideshow for them with some pictures from his world. And he knew that some of the things that he was experiencing in his world would be offensive to his family, and so he paid very close attention to what he put together. He wanted to make sure that the images weren't too violent, weren't too scary, but were just fun and, and relaxed, something encouraging to let them know that he was doing fine. He decided to put music over the top of this, uh, but he paid special attention to the music. He wanted to make sure that it was upbeat, that what he thought would be something that was uplifting. He sends it to his family, and he never heard anything about it after that. He eventually got home, had been home for a little bit. No one had ever said anything about this slideshow he sent, and so he decided to ask some questions. And his family asked him to watch it again. And when he watched it again, now back home, out of that context, in a different place, he saw the images more clearly, and it was highly offensive. Some of the images contained um, adult material. The language in the songs were colorful. And he sent this to his mother. While on duty, he didn't see or hear any of that. His conscience had become so seared that he didn't see it or hear it. But back home, he could see and hear in a different way. He heard the words of the songs differently. He saw the images differently. His conscience had become so calloused, so seared, that simple communication for him had become highly offensive to his family. Is there any part of that in you? because you can shape your conscience. Have you abused your conscience? Have you violated your conscience so much that it no longer speaks to you? Because God may speak to you through your conscience, but just because your conscience holds you back or gives you freedom, it doesn't mean you can blindly trust it as God's word to you. And so even within our conscience, we hold it against those lighthouses that we saw before. We weigh it against the truth of Scripture. We go back to our community of Jesus followers. We consider what it is that God has plainly revealed in his will through wisdom, and we measure our conscience against those truths. Similarly, God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit in these instincts that we have. We call them these inward instincts. It starts in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. He says, You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human 
hearts. In this new covenant, in the New Testament, God has written his law in the hearts of his people. And that's significant language because in the Old Testament, he did it differently. God wrote it, his law, on stone where everyone could see it and everyone could read it. And he told the people what it was that they were supposed to do. But now in the new covenant, in the New Testament, it's different. The Holy Spirit lives within us and he leads us and he guides us and he speaks directly to us. And it often feels like an inward prompting, a nudge from within. In Sweet's book that we've been referencing here, he gives the illustration of hot tea. He says that at first you have your your cup of hot tea or your hot water, you put your tea bag into it, and for a time there's still separation. You can see the difference. You can see where water exists, you can see where tea bag is, and you can see where they're separate from each other. But over time, eventually you'll look into the cup and there's no difference. Water no longer exists. The tea bag is still there, but the water has become tea. It's the same with the Holy Spirit. It's how he works in us. When we accept Jesus into our life, the Holy Spirit moves in and he begins to lead us. He begins to guide us. And slowly over time, we start seeing, we start seeing how the Holy Spirit comes out just naturally from who we are. And what happens is that this voice, God's voice, this, his nudges, this work of the Spirit in us creates this inward instinct to where our thoughts, and I need you to hear this plainly, Okay to where our thoughts and our feelings and our desires are actually coming from God. What I just said was that the Holy Spirit works in us to where our thoughts and our feelings and our desires start coming from God. I need you to pay attention to this and recognize how incredibly dangerous it is what I just said. This is tough and this is difficult because when I say these things, you could misunderstand this and you could make it out to where you turn yourself into a God. If you misunderstand this, you can walk away from here thinking that just because you thought it, felt it, or desired it, that it must be the word of God because you accepted Jesus and the Holy Spirit's working within you. And that's not true. It's not true. Just because you feel it, think it, desire it, doesn't mean it's the Holy Spirit. Your thoughts, your feelings, your desires are highly selfish and misleading. These instincts that are within us could be from the Holy Spirit or it could be from something very different. So the trick is for us, we have to discern when our thoughts and our feelings are our own will or if it's reflecting the Lord's mind, feelings, and will. And because this is so dangerous and because this is such a big deal, Scripture speaks to this. In 1 John chapter 4, uh, John puts it this way. He says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Test the spirits. That sounds to me like the angel devil thing on the shoulder, doesn't it? That every thought you have isn't of God. It's not always true. It's not always noble. It's not always valuable. It's not always helpful. It's not always of God. Sometimes my thoughts are of me. Sometimes I don't even need Satan to be on my shoulder to lead me astray. I'm actually pretty good enough at it on my own. And so I weigh my own thoughts. I weigh my own feelings. I weigh my own desires to make sure that they're matching up with what the word of God says those other lighthouses. 2 Corinthians 10.5 puts it this way. Uh, Paul writes here, he says, take every thought captive. Take every thought captive. Just because it's in my head doesn't mean it's from God. I'm not God. I have a Holy Spirit. And, and look, he's working in me and he's trying to lead me and he's trying to guide me. But I do a really good job of ignoring him. I do a good job of pushing him aside, and so I have to work to make sure that every thought I'm having is actually one of God. Before I act on my thoughts or my feelings or desires, I measure it. I see which spirit it's coming from. I try to make sure that it's of God. This past Monday in our staff meeting, this verse was actually brought up in our devotion. And it was said that in order to take every thought captive, you need to consider two questions. You need to ask, where did the thought come from and where does the thought take me? Where does the thought come from and where does the thought take me? And I love that. I love that idea because I have lots of thoughts and they're not all from a good place. And so I measure them against the word of God, that first lighthouse. I look at other Jesus followers in my life, that second lighthouse. I look at the ways in which God has plainly revealed his will into this world, that third lighthouse. I measure the thoughts in my head against those things and I recognize whether or not it's from God or whether it's from something else. And then I ask this question, where does the thought take me? 
because there are some thoughts that are cleverly, cleverly disguised thoughts. They seem to be good, they seem to be holy, but in all actuality, they're, they're self-serving. And so I have to take those thoughts captive. I look into scripture, I look at my fellow Jesus followers, I look at the plainly revealed will around me, and I ask the question, where does this thought take me? Just because it seems good at the front doesn't guarantee it's of God. It could be a cleverly disguised thought or desire or feeling. And so I check it up against God. What does it look like? What does it look like to have these instincts within us? Have you ever had one of those moments when you feel like something just stirred or moved within you? Maybe you said something or you did something that wasn't really normal for you, not something you would have normally said or done, but you did, and then you recognize that it was beneficial for someone else and you were as surprised as they were. <laughs> have you ever been on the receiving end of that? Maybe you've, you've heard someone say the right thing or the right time or maybe someone gave you the right thing at the right time or maybe they cared for you in the right way at the right time and it caused you to worship and celebrate your God. It might look like something like that. It might look like caring for someone who's homeless. It might be reaching out to someone who randomly comes to mind. Maybe you're, maybe you're doing the dishes or yard work or you're just sitting on your phone at home and some person just comes to mind and you decide to pray for them or maybe you decide to send them a text or call them and reach out to them and, and, and pray with them or check on them, whatever it may be. That may be one of those nudges from God, the time when the Holy Spirit just kind of moves you in some way that you weren't necessarily expecting those ways in which that magnet kind of pushes or pulls us toward doing something. This past week, as I was preparing this sermon, uh, Doc, has, uh, Doc has introduced me to his close friend, Randy. I know he speaks of Randy all the time. It's, he calls him his preaching partner. I'd like to think that Randy and I are now preaching partners. It's a, it's a new relationship, so we'll see, all right? But we were talking over the sermon, and he began telling just this incredible story of, of some of his friends. He had, a, he had a group of friends who were in a plane crash, with the Eastern Tennessee State University basketball team. This was years ago. Randy one day opened the paper and he read the headline that this team had crashed and that there had been no fatalities, no casualties. And so he immediately called his friends who he knew would have been on that plane and he began asking them questions. There were minimal injuries, there were zero casualties, and there was zero plane left. They got off this plane and it was gone within a minute. And yet everybody was able to escape alive. And then Randy's friends started telling him these incredible stories. He said that there was this man who, who dropped them off at the airport, the bus driver. And the bus driver said that after he dropped them off at the airport, he couldn't calm his spirit. He tried to sit down and eat, but he couldn't even eat. There was something just moving in him, and he couldn't figure out what it was. And he was just wrestling and struggling, couldn't figure out what he was. He eventually found himself, this bus driver eventually found himself on the floor in his bus praying for this basketball team he had just dropped off at the airport. And he didn't understand why until he heard the news. At the same time, one of the coaches had a wife who was back home with their children. One of the kids woke up from a nightmare in the middle of the night. She told her mother that she'd had a dream that her dad had died in a plane crash. And so the wife wakes the other kids. She pulls them together and they begin praying for the safety of her husband and their father. Another coach had a mother who'd been sitting in a prayer group earlier that day. And she decided to offer a prayer of safe travels for this basketball team. And it's not something that she typically would have done or even thought about, but for whatever reason, she felt led. She felt inclined. She felt inspired. She felt nudged to just verbally communicate a desire for prayer of safety over this basketball team. Three different scenarios in three different parts of the country all responding to this nudge. Something within them moved them, and they responded appropriately. It can be much simpler than that. There may be times in your life when maybe you feel nudged to just spend some time in prayer with God, to read his word. What I want you to see is that the voice of God is like a voice and that it gives us instructions, but it's not really a voice. It's more of this instinct. It's this leading that we just feel from God. And so it means that we need to be alert and attentive. We need to be attentive to what's happening in our circumstances and the lives of the people around us. We have to be alert to what other people are saying to us. We need to look for the Lord's voice in the mundane events of everyday life and see where God may be leading it. This is a beautiful poem by a, by a woman named Elizabeth Barrett Browning. I'm not 
like big into poetry, okay? So this isn't anything from there, but this may be my new favorite poem. I don't know. I, I don't know that I even had one before this, okay? But she writes it this way, and I love this language. She starts by saying this, earth's crammed with heaven, and I just love that idea. I love that idea that in the mundane plainness of this world that we live in, that it's just stuffed full of heaven. The idea that the world is something heavenly absolutely everywhere that we look. That there's something deeply spiritual about the world that we live in. And then she says this, and every common bush of fire with God. And I love the imagery here. This has taken us back to the Old Testament in that moment when Moses finds himself standing before a burning bush. And God is within that bush. You remember the story? And he's blown away, he's surprised, but he sees it. She says, every common bush is a fire with God. And then she says, but only he who sees it takes off his shoes. Moses sees it. He hears the voice of God. He takes off his shoes. He's aware of it. He's attentive to it. He responds appropriately to it. The idea that we could see every common bush of fire with God and that we could actually approach and take off our shoes. But this is, this is where it gets sad. The rest sit around and pluck blueberries. They're unaware, they're ignorant of what God is doing around them. How often have I been the one eating blueberries? Missing the leading of God in my life. These moments when these instincts in us come up and we don't even pay attention to it. We're not aware. We're not living in an alertness and attentiveness to the world and what's taking place around us. In this series, we've challenged you to consider how God may be speaking to you, and we've designed the rest of this service for you to specifically engage in this question. It's going to start with this. In just a moment, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's something we do every single week because we don't want to ever come into this place and not pay attention to what Jesus has done for us on the cross. It is the absolute foundation for everything that we believe and everything we talk about. Even the nudges of God in our life are built on the foundation of Christ's redeeming work on the cross. And so every time we get together, we pause and we eat a little bit of bread, we drink a little bit of juice, and we remember. And here at Cap City, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we also We also celebrate by giving. When you move to these worship stations, you'll see that there's also a box there that says offering on it. And that's the place where our Cap City family chooses to give back. There's no expectation if you're a guest that you would participate in that, but if you're family, these are the places where we respond in gratefulness and in worship to our God. We give back the first parts of what he's given to us. And then sometimes we feel so overwhelmed, sometimes we feel so overwhelmed by the goodness of God and that we feel compelled, we feel compelled to give back to God. We feel compelled to honor him with even more. And when we do that, we have these buckets that we call the generous bucket, where we give above and beyond. And we recognize that that that's a way that we can just be generous back to God. We take what's in the generous buckets, and we go to bless people within this church and people within this community. And because of that, we've impacted lots of lives. Every week we do this. Every week we get up and we go to these tables. Today, though, we're going to extend that out a little bit. It's not going to be as quick as it usually is. It's intentionally going to be left long, and it's going to be intentionally left quiet. It's going to be really quiet in here for a while because we want to use some time to be attentive to God and see if he would speak to us, see if he would speak to you. So over these moments, as you move to the tables, as you move back to your seats, there's going to be some stuff on the screen. There's going to be some scripture because we've seen that God speaks to us through his word. So there's going to be words on the screen. And if you want to try to engage with God in that way, that'd be great. There's going to be different scriptures cycling through. I want you to read them. I want you to pray over them. I want you to let them speak to your heart. See if God doesn't speak something powerful to you this morning. And in this series, we've also seen how God speaks through the body of Christ. During this time when you're up and you're moving around the room, I'm giving you permission right now to not go back to your seats, but to instead feel free to go to somebody else. Go to a friend and pray with them. Go to someone that you believe maybe God has laid on your heart and pray over them. Maybe maybe you need prayer. 
And so go to a friend, go to someone you trust and ask them to pray over you. Doc and I will be sitting up here if you want to come up and have us, we'll pray over you. We have an elder who's back in the room over your shoulders, back in in the back corner of the room over here praying. If you're online, feel free to write in and ask for prayer. Pray with each other. Pray with your family. Have your spouse, husbands, grab your wife and your kids and bring them together and pray over them. Just as God speaks to us through through Scripture, he speaks through his body of believers. Engage with the body of Christ and see if God doesn't speak something to you today. And as we've seen today, he also speaks through these inward instincts of the Holy Spirit. Maybe during this time, you need to consider what you've been ignoring from God. Maybe God has been trying to speak to you. Maybe there's been something moving in your conscience or it could be this instinct moving within you. Maybe God is calling you out or maybe he's been nudging you into some form of action and you've been kind of just like putting it off. I want you to consider what you've been ignoring from God. I want you to respond appropriately in this time. And that may be a text message to somebody. It may be a prayer. It may be reading his word. It may be lots of different ways in which you could respond appropriately but I want you to speak. I want you to engage with God. I want you to see if he doesn't speak to you. I want you to know that this time is going to be very, like, intentionally left very quiet, which means that there's going to be lots of distractions. You're going to hear people praying for one another, hopefully here. You're going to be tempted to pull out your phone, fight those things, fight those temptations, and recognize that this is an opportunity to listen to God, to feel his nudge. And then eventually, at some point, you'll hear my voice again at the front of the stage, and we're going to go back into worship. And when we do, that doesn't mean that we're done trying to listen to God. And so if you need to continue worshiping in those same ways, feel free. Continue to sit and pray. Continue to read God's word, or feel free to stand and worship God. Just respond appropriately. And one last piece. If you aren't a Jesus follower, if you're a guest or if you're not really sure about this whole deal, I dare you to try this today. I dare you to try it. I know it's weird. I know this stuff sounds strange. I know that it, (laughs) I know it seems a bit ridiculous. But I dare you to just try it. I dare you to read God's word. I dare you to pray over it. I dare you to check your conscience and check your instincts and see if God hasn't been speaking to you. As we prepare to move and try to listen into God, let's pray together. God, you are good to us, and God, I love the fact that your Holy Spirit moves within us, and now in this moment, I pray that you would move and we would hear. I pray that your Spirit would speak to us. God, I pray that your community here would love one another and care for one another and pray over one another. God, I pray that even as we celebrate the work of your Son on the cross, that we would celebrate your work of the Spirit in this church and that we we would be faithful to your nudges to us. God, lead and guide us in all things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go to the table.
we're not done. I want to encourage you to continue working, to listen to God and how he may be speaking to you. If you need prayer, come up front. Still got an elder back there. Grab someone, ask them to pray over you. If you need to have a conversation with someone about what it looks like to follow Jesus, please come have that conversation. Meet with Doc and I now. You can meet with us after the service, whatever it may be. We'd love to have those conversations with you. Continue worshiping in this moment, however you feel led.